Welcome to the Rock Off Rugby Podcast with me, Mark Moss. And me, Sam Leeming. This week's episode, we have a very special guest on the show, uh, USA International, Will Hooley. A teammate of mine, Will, uh, we had a great in-depth conversation about all things uh, championship and RFU cuts, as well as his journey um, to uh, the USA and to Saracens, but also some off-field um, uh, antics in his writing and his most recent fascinating piece on James Taylor, the cricketer. Um, so really, really good conversation and I uh, hope you enjoy. So welcome to the Rock Off Rugby Podcast, uh, Saracen's new signing, Will Hooley. Congratulations on the move, Will. Cheers, guys. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, so for the guys, um, so for the Saracen's fans, really give us a bit of a synopsis of your career and uh, where you've gone to, where you've been so far. I moved around a little bit, which I don't know if that sounds correct, but you know what I mean. Um, no, so I, for me, I, I started my kind of professional rugby journey at Northampton Saints, uh, came right the way through the academy there into the first team um, and then decided to um, move myself to Exeter Chiefs where I was there for uh, two um, really great years, albeit in my second one, I, I struggled a bit with a bit of injury um, and then from that point that was the decision that I needed to go and play more regular rugby so then I moved myself to Bedford Blues where I've been um, I want to say for three seasons, but because of COVID-19, it's literally like you can't say it's a full season, can't you? So, yeah, I've been, I've been, been there for three, yeah, three years, two and a half seasons, whatever you want to call it. Um, and now uh, I've signed up with, um, yeah, with the Wolfpack. So, um, obviously, yeah, congratulations for Sarah as well. Um, bit, big move for you. Um, looking forward then, um, hopefully when the season gets start, started up again, what what are you most looking forward to? You know, obviously new challenge playing with some some big dogs down there that they've managed to keep. Um, what are you most looking forward to? I think for me, mate, like it's 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 the environment more than more than anything. You know, I think whatever's happened with Saris over the last season or year, whatever you want to call it, um, that's got nothing to do with me. And uh, whether you whether it's right or wrong, you know, it's not something where coming in I have sort of as I say anything to do with and, and therefore have any thoughts about as well. So the, the fact that I know about Saracens is that the environment is very good. I think it's pretty special what they've created there for the last, well, numerous seasons now. And to kind of, as a still someone at an age of 26, really wanting to learn, really wanting to kick on, really wanting to develop still. Um, it's just, a, I say, it's a fantastic environment to sort of see myself hopefully spending a good amount of time in and uh, getting the most out of uh, and be surrounded by quality players, um, quality coaches. Um, so, yeah, those are all the kind of things which I'm kind of most looking forward to. Yeah, like it's a massively elite environment, isn't it? Um, looking at uh, what they've been doing in the Premiership, uh, winning that, winning the European Championships on more se- more occasions and not in the, in the coming seasons. It's a massive, massive club with that amazing environment like you're talking about. Uh, what's what's your biggest goal really for, for when you when you're there? Um, I think to be honest, at the moment, considering the times we live in, um, you know, I think it's very much about if depending obviously when this pod is released, but whether the Premiership releases it, sorry, re- resumes. Um, obviously, the the idea of getting involved in that is, is pretty exciting. Um, albeit, still don't really have a clue kind of what that season looks like um, and then what the next season looks like. It's quite hard to set goals as such. But for me, look, I, I just want to establish myself and get my, my head down and, and work hard. I know that's such a cliche thing to say, but I, I just kind of feel at the moment that's all I can kind of um, resort to because, as I say, goals are quite hard to set when you just don't really know what the rugby calendar is going to look like. Um, and for, for me, I, I know the high-quality players that are in there. The competition is going to be incredibly hard. But... I personally feel that that's where I flourish um, and can get the best out of myself. And that's all I'm trying to do, trying to, you know, get the best out of me and be the best I can. So uh, I do believe that being in an environment like Saracens, as we talked about before, then, you know, that's going to hopefully, uh, I'll reap the rewards. If the um, if the Prem comes back, Will, cause so could you be in that squad to end this yeah, think, season? Yeah, I think that was released quite early on, wasn't it? That the, the Premiership <laughs> came out and said it. that they are going to be... That, 
new signings can be involved. I'm pretty sure I read that somewhere. Yeah, it's it's such a weird one because I feel like the thing is changing every kind of day. Yeah, you know, one moment idea. you hear that, one moment you hear that you can, then the next moment you hear RFU rule four point something or other, <laughs> whereby the player has got to finish a season um, in this time window, and because the the season was finished actually in March uh, or whenever it was. Um, then actually, there's still things that players for the club that they they were at there and then they are liable to. I literally heard this today on a, well, the other day on another podcast. So it's so weird. It's so bizarre. I don't think anyone really knows completely what's going on. But I think all in all, the kind of the right way of thinking, I imagine, is that if you are contractually obliged at someone come the first of July then you like to think that you're going to be playing for that team. So if the idea is that I could be selected for that, then fantastic, you know. Um, and uh, and it's one that obviously for myself and any other new signings will relish to get right into it uh, from the off. So moving on, moving on, we'll, um, obviously you've had about six or seven months, I think it's been to uh, digest the, the World Cup and uh, what happened over there, Will. Um, obviously quite quite a tricky uh Tricky job coming back to a to a championship. Um, some of those rainy days. I remember at Doncaster. Not not happy memories, but <laughs> you had you've had time to digest it now. You know, do you look back on it now in a in a sort of different light? I suppose you, you know you've had time to chat to a few people and, and mull it over. How, how are you? Um, any lessons and stuff you've taken from that? Mate, it's a good question because actually you are right in that in the last well the kind of this lockdown period and and doing you know bits and bobs like this and, and writing and other media stuff which has been good fun uh it's funny how everyone's doing a podcast at the moment eh? <laughs> hey, you don't you can't play hey, no, we, no, we no, jumped no, on no, the button no, wagon exactly why not you've got it you've got it while not? it's hot yeah. well the iron is hot but um yeah no it, it's actually been a really refreshing opportunity to chat to some of the u.s boys catch up <coughs> excuse me and um and reminisce a little bit because actually as soon as that World Cup finished it was like got back home unpacked the bags back into Bedford training I literally went from Osaka to Doncaster in the space of about 10 days which I think yeah did shock me uh, a little bit um, and you never really had time to sort of think about it all and it's only really genuinely recently and I'm not just saying it for the sake of the, your guys benefit but I've actually managed to look back and think and just kind of think what yeah, I'm very proud of the achievement. I'm very proud of, of being at that tournament, getting myself to that tournament, um, you know, because it was, it was hard. Competition was hard. And all the stuff that we did before the World Cup was really tough. You know, we had big games against Samoa, Japan, uh, Canada, um, all in Fiji. I mean, we literally travelled the world. We went to Vancouver, went to Suva, we went to uh, Denver. Uh, and it seemed like I was shuttling back to London for like a couple of weeks off and back to Denver. So it was crazy, and, and and but at the same time, when I look back, I just think, wow, that was what an incredible adventure. On the rugby side of things, it was brilliant. I found like I got the absolute best out of myself. I felt like I was in the best shape I possibly could have been in. I, I don't look back and think, oh, I wish I was a bit stronger, fitter, or quicker. I kind of feel like I threw myself at it. I gave myself every opportunity to to try and play well, and there was definitely times when I managed to do that. I think when we got to the World Cup, though. The disappointment ultimately with the results. You're not there to make up the numbers. We were in a really hard group. We had England, we had France, we had Argentina and Tonga. Um, and I think we, building up, and I'm talking about even the year before, we really thought as a team, as a nation, we could go and shock the world. We had beaten the likes of Scotland, we'd beaten Samoa, Samoa uh, on the double. Um, we'd taken Ireland really all the way for 65 minutes in Dublin um, in the 2018 Autumn Series. And it was kind of like, when we got to the World Cup, the pressure moments, we just, we weren't successful. We were a bit too predictable. And it was very frustrating to look back and just think, oh, like, that, we didn't show, in my opinion, a massive great account of ourselves as to what we could do, the talent that we had. And when it's every four years, um, that's a bit tricky because you can't just go, oh, oh, next weekend, I'll sort it all out. Or as a team, we think that. You know, it's not like that. It's, it's very much sort of, that's your opportunity Next one's in 2023. Um, I are going to be chomping at the bit to get there. Um, but that squad, that team, obviously won't be the same. Guys will retire. Guys, and you know, won't make it to the next World Cup. Um, but I'm not being doom and gloom about it. I've just been honest. Like the results-wise yeah. of the competition, 
were, was disappointing. The memories of those boys, you know, family, uh, my, my missus was out there, my parents out there, my brother was out there, friends were out in Japan. It was incredible and, and one which I'd obviously never forget. Yeah, so, so obviously, uh, when did the USA journey start for you? Obviously, you don't sound very American, brought up in England, very prominent English accent. When, when did this come about for you? When, did, when was the realisation that you could play for America? So you can't hear my deep twang, Texas <laughs> twang. Um, yeah, no, oh, I use that joke all the time. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's, it was, it, to be honest, it was, it I genuinely was in the back of my mind probably for the last kind of five years um, because my grandmother, so my dad's mum, born, raised, Los Angeles girl and met my grandfather over in, in Los Angeles. And my granddad was to, to do with the um, filming production. She was involved in the entertainment industry. She literally was working in Hollywood and they met there, but they actually ended up settling back in uh, Liverpool, England. So you go from Hollywood to Liverpool, make that, you know, make of that as you will. And then, um, and then, yeah, because Steve, my dad, that, that point, the relatives, when I came into the world, any kind of relative that we had out in, in the US had either passed away or had lot, kind of lost contact with. So I never, as a youngster, even went to the US. I've got to be honest, because there was no reason to. Um, but my dad always knew, he, he sat next to a guy or well, playing for Exeter Chiefs against Worcester, sat next to a guy and his wife, and they were American, talked to my dad, and he loves talking to everyone, um, and talked about my dad's mum, American, blah, blah, blah. At the end of the game, the guy goes, well, hold on a minute, who are you watching? And I came off the bench that day, I think got 25 minutes to say it's Worcester, played pretty well in the premiership, and the guy was basically um, on the board of directors for USA Rugby. And it literally was just from that point, it was like an exchange of email because he was like, would, would your son be interested? And my dad was like, well, I'm not going to make a decision for him, but obviously I'll pass it on. But they then scouted me for, a, for another sort of six months, spoke to my agent at the time. And it really got to the point whereby it was like, I had to make a decision. Do I want to go down the route of the USA, which we'll come on to in terms of the great things that happened? Or do you cling on to the fact that like, I played in the age group, I was involved in a premiership team, Oh, I'd love to play for England, blah, blah, blah. But then you have to be realistic. It's the best decision I've made. To this day, I still believe that. And I kind of would advocate for any kind of youngster, if you've got an avenue to gain yourself in the rugby world and play for a team you have a big passion in, you know, I've absolutely loved, then it's, you know, definitely something you should do. Absolutely. What one opportunity for you to, yeah, like you said, didn't, didn't go with the US when you are younger and one opportunity to go over there, experience that side of things and then go to World Cup. Like, yeah, you'd certainly not um, regret anything now, are you? <laughs> well, I think, I mean, to be honest, I think you do see there's a few guys, um, you know, who might get like um, a couple of caps here and there. For, so a good friend of mine, um, so Murray Lowe, who was a prop, Scottish prop um, for Exeter, he had a, one of his best mates who I think played Scotland Day or something or other, and he was American qualified. And when I was at Exeter, when I eventually made the decision to say yes to the US, when I came to them bed, Bedford, is Murray just turned around to me and said, my mate honestly regrets it so much that he played for Scotland A and he didn't go and play for the US and get many more caps, go travel around the world, play in a World Cup. So it was those sort of moments which just made me think, geez, if I don't take this opportunity now, it may go and I'll never get it back. So luckily I did, luckily I took it. Yeah, it's a really exciting time for American rugby as well, isn't it? With the development of the MR, MLR. Um, you've been, how long have you been involved with the US setup now for? How long? So I've been, um, I did my first camp at the end of 2017, first cap in 2018. So when the MLR started yeah. in 2018, yeah, I, 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 that was when I kind of started with USA rugby. Have you, uh, have you been keeping an eye on that division, see how that's progressing? And has that translated uh, on the on-field training with, with, with the guys in the squad? Has that developed there? Yeah, mate. I mean, it's, it's, it's so important for rugby in the US to have a professional, well-structured league. And they finally got that. They tried and failed a few times over the last kind of decade uh, with various other professional leagues that just didn't succeed. Money, you know, went to pot, blah, blah, blah. 
this one is really well structured in a very professional way. Um, and at the end of the day, if you've got guys playing professional rugby, um, you've got a bigger pool of quality players to choose from. So that's going to help the national team. You know, guys are training in professional environments, playing week in, week out, quality rugby matches and in, in, in sort of pressure environments as well. That will translate into, as I say, come international matches. And I definitely think it has. I definitely think it's massively improved. When I joined the US in 2018, the whole squad, that was like the first squad they assembled who were all professional. And I was like, how weird is this? Like before, literally six months, but it wasn't six months before, it was the autumn in 2017, only half, half, maybe 60% of the squad was fully professional. The others weren't, they were semi-professional out in the States. So I think that was sort of the turn of the tide. And, and, and Major League Rugby's massively helped that. And it's definitely something I keep an eye on. Um, and it could be something for, you know, an opt to do in the future. Well, yeah, it's a massive talent pool, isn't it, America? Obviously, with, and the, without a shadow of a doubt, they have the best athletes in the world. Uh, just albeit they're in different sports at the minute. So it, it, it's a hugely untapped market, in my opinion. And with the development of this pre- professional league, I can only see the USA going from strength to strength in the rugby world. Yeah, I think, you know, it's not quite as simple as people might view it as. I think I've spoken to Sam a little bit about it before. Rugby, America is a, well, as you probably see on the news and TV, it's a funny, (laughs) funny country. Um, (laughs) And I absolutely love it to bits. And I say it's very close to my family, family's heart. But at the same time, they are, the people over there, it needs to be accessible. And what I mean by accessible, accessible is, Rugby needs to be on the TVs. It needs to literally be put in front of people to watch and be like, oh, what's that game? You know, because I go to matches when we play in the States and there's always new fans who then come up and be like, oh my God, our first rugby match I've been to, this is incredible. I so want to watch this rather than the NFL or whatever. But they need to be able to watch it. Then they need to be able to access it in the colleges. So that's massive to be a collegiate sort of sport, which is starting to develop. And then finally, yeah, it needs to be a really good, strong professional league that enables then the national team to be good because US, they like to be good at their sports. If they're not good at their sports, then they're kind of less bothered. I think you, you see that with the, the sevens, the sevens programme, don't you, Will? Like they've become an absolute force on the sevens circuit and, you know, a real competitor. And I suppose Mark's done some coaching in, in Canada and, and he, he'll be able to give an insight better. But I suppose especially with American football, baseball, um, soccer is huge again. You know, I think it's, yeah, it's still developing and I think, I think it will come. It'll just, again, it's a developing league. Um, what's your thoughts on the, the new uh, Los Angeles team name? Was it Jill? Jill, Jill, Jill <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but well, the thing is, right, is that, I mean, it's so great that there's another yeah. franchise team. I mean, Los, Los Angeles, I mean, everyone knows Los Angeles, the place, whether you've been there or not. Yeah. Um, now the guy is the guy who owns it is a guy called Adam Gilchrist, not the Australian wicketkeeper. Before you think, you might think that, um, but um, he is multi-millionaire, rich man. He owns the Austin franchise, who are called the Gil Gronies, Gil Gronin, yeah. or something like that. And then he owns the Los Angeles franchise, which are called the Giltinis. So Gil Gilchrist is in Sorry. there. But the one thing I'd say, I think it is a. Uh, it's a little bit of a cringy name, but it's getting people talking. Yeah, I've literally yeah. saw my social media the next day. People were talking about it. People were talking about the MLR. People were like, you know, oh my God, this silly team, but look at them. They're going to be playing at Venice Beach. Now, I don't know how well and logistically it's going to go. I mean, it will take some time to develop, but that's what American needs. It needs people to be talking about the league um, because that will excite, you know, rugby fans around the world. It's been disruptive, isn't it? You know, it's social media in the world of social media nowadays. If you can be disruptive, you know, any publicity is good publicity to a certain extent, and it's getting them talking, like you said, mate, massively. And, and obviously, when you're still like a, a young uh, league, which the MLR is, yes. um, it's things like I mean, we, we, we could talk forever about it, but I actually believe COVID, and we'll talk about this later, COVID 19 is, is going to have an effect on everyone and everything. In terms of sport, rugby is going to take a huge hit. I have absolutely no doubt about that. It's very sad to think of it. It was very pessimistic to even say it like that, but it's true. But for MLR, because of they haven't put loads of money into it yet, they're kind of steadily building. They're not necessarily having lost a lot of money. 
And therefore, they would be like, oh, hold on a minute. A lot of players are going to be interested about coming here. A lot of people are wanting to maybe see what that league is going to do because they're in a position of basically development and growth. Meanwhile, we've got other leagues in the world, which we'll come on to, who are stagnated, you know, only looking like they're going one way. And that's down. Um, so I actually think, you know, MLR could come out quite strong maybe next year when it starts again. Because again, the league starts in, in February, January. So hopefully COVID won't be too much of a problem come 2021. Yeah, really interesting, isn't it? Like, it, there are some big names going out there um, towards the end of the career, but I think with this, what's going on at the minute, I think there'll be a lot more younger players going out from different nations. I think it's going to be a really, really interesting league moving forward. I think just just last thing to sort of finish on that is that mm. the one thing that is going to happen is there's going to be a very much a cap on the amount of foreigners that they yeah. they can do. And now I've had a bunch of players even contact myself asking me if I can help them in any way through contacts that I know over there, and I always will, will try. But at the same time, I also am a big believer that because I play for the US, the internal talent needs to come through. You know, you can't have a top fourteen. Toulon example where you literally are buying in the best players in the world which is great but at the same time the whole point is I don't think that really does anything great for the USA rugby there needs to be a good balance I think they are definitely doing that and therefore as much as yet we hope we will see a good amount of foreigners going over there and hopefully even some youngsters as well maybe even from the championship you know it needs to balance with obviously the talent uh, that's coming through in the US to making sure they've got the opportunity to to be successful. Well, I think that's what the clubs are doing as well. Uh, I I know the uh, I know the GM of uh, the Toronto Arrows, and I spoke to mm-hmm. him about getting uh, getting a player over there a couple of years ago now, because uh, he was over there on a work visa in in Canada, and he was saying, yeah, it's great. We can we can offer him a trial. He can come and have a look at all this. But really, what we want to focus on is getting Canadian players through, and it's the same as what the same, same as what the American franchise are doing. They're focusing on getting these American players through, which is why the draft's bit going to be. So interesting. Yeah, that's that's going to be very interesting. I think there's a few people who are a bit against it. I think there's a few people who are who are very pro for it. My opinion is, is I, I'm very interested to see how it's going to work. So I'm not going to make judgment just yet. No, exactly. But again, it's some it's something that's new. It's something that you know, rugby might look at and be like, oh, that's something that's going to you know flavor it up on on social media and stuff like that. So we shall see. Definitely. So, um, moving on then, well, um, off field stuff, we've interviewed a few, uh, sort of younger, younger lads on, on the podcast and it's been really interesting to see how they're balancing either playing at university or in the champ and, and working alongside writing something that you've gained a bit of traction from and, and, um, got some fantastic interviews for where did that, that journey start and, um, how, how much of an impact is that having sort of getting a release away from rugby? But it's, I mean, before I go into that, it's so vital that, that people do, you know, do stuff outside the game. I mean, what you guys are doing is, is great, you know, little things like this. It just shows you in this time, COVID, that is, that it, rugby's so vulnerable. And again, I've said it before, all sport, all, all jobs are vulnerable, but I find it kind of feel rugby in particular, and for rugby players, you are very vulnerable as it is. And therefore, you chuck a pandemic in the mix and it becomes becomes tough so you can't have all your eggs in one basket I've probably it was it was my parents made sure that you know I was very fortunate I got school very well I love my school um and I came away from it feeling that you know if I went down another route other than rugby I could do it um as for writing again it was kind of one of those things that came about um through a bit of an unlucky a lucky event um I um picked up I, unfortunately I, I had a a um, couple of concussions over the last year, but I actually picked up my worst, I say worst, like it was kind of one of my first proper concussions back in 2016, I was playing for Exeter and it took me out for a while. I was very kind of slow to get back fully. I think it was also precaution, the Exeter staff, brilliant for me. Um, and it was in that time eventually when I kind of got back to be able to get back on computers, I have no sort of problems. But I, the degree that I had been doing at the Open University at the time, I had to basically stop because I was so far behind. And it was like, I wanted to do something. The media guy at the Chiefs spoke to me, about, would you be interested about interviewing this old ex-player? Did that, wrote an article with his help, 
and it went really well. And in fact, the RPA at the time basically said, look, this is an opportunity at the University of Staffordshire to do a part-time distance uh, learning degree in sports uh, writing journalism. So I took that up. I hopefully will graduate in August. No idea that's actually going to happen, <laughs> but that, you know, that's the aim. And, um, and the kind of the rest is history. So that's how I kind of got into it. And then as for actually writing, I'm, I'm dyslexic, so I should not be good Snap. at kind of Eng English, English literature. I'm just a bit uh, dumb, I'm, never mind dyslexic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I pro I'm, I'm probably exactly the same. I think we're in the same boat. But the thing is, is like, I, 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 I still struggle. But at the same time, I just found I was just enjoying it. I was enjoying, you know, interviewing people, writing things. Um, and eventually you know, create a website where I just put my material on. I then got basically the, the head of writing for The Guardian asked, would I be interested in a sports blog when I went to the World Cup? And I thought, well, it's a bit of extra coin, you know, be, be a bit of fun. Why not? And I absolutely loved it. And ever since then, I've continued writing for The Guardian and um, still on a sort of pathway to, you know, get involved in media business, whether it's writing, whether it's podcasts or whatever and thoroughly enjoy it and that's the main thing you've got to do something you enjoy outside the game because otherwise you just won't do it that's awesome i think um with obviously again we'll, we'll come on to the champ and, and the situation we have there but i think especially for the situation we're in now it's so important and so valuable especially for the, the guardian to have a, a you know player representative and, and something that comes from you obviously it's moderated and all the rest of it but i think that's really valuable for them and, and gives a like great insight you know coming straight from the horse's mouth yeah, mate, I think it's so key that, uh, particularly for rugby, because rugby uh, is at the moment kind of, and in all departments and governing bodies, even in the media, uh, and I'm not saying this in all a negative way, there's some brilliant characters, uh, brilliant writers, um, and I must point out that Rob Kitson, who basically has kind of been my mentor, who's head rugby writer at The Guardian, he is brilliant. Um, but it's run by a lot of people who are, should we say, a bit older. And therefore, mm. rugby in their day was amateur. And my big thing is to make sure that, yeah, you're right, people are coming through, current players, uh, guys who've just retired, to make sure they're giving the readership and the viewers uh, that kind of uh, detailed insight, which I think is always good. I think it gives, um, I think you've, like, obviously, you've done a few really good interviews. I think Sam wants to talk a bit about your James Taylor one you've just done. Um, it, gives, it gives them that little bit of, how, how can I word it? That, that little bit more trust in you, knowing that you're in that similar situation to what they are in that professional sport environment. Um, your main job is as a professional sportsman, not as a writer. Um, and you can kind of relate to these professionals a little bit more as well. Yeah, for sure. I mean, actually, with the James Taylor piece, that was so I connected with James Taylor a few years back because I think his agent was the same as mine at the time. Um, and I just kind of sent over a message and just kind of like would you be interested in and he was he was absolutely brilliant absolutely top bloke you know down to earth i mean his story you know in terms of having to retire from cricket after a life-threatening heart condition that he still lives with now is incredible and um, and i think you're right i think there is genuine that trust that if a, if a sports person speaks to a sports person you're not going to you know throw him under the carpet uh, sorry throw him under the bus um but at the same time you know you've got to you've got to be careful because a lot of the good stuff you want to read in these newspapers are the ones who are quite opinionated a little bit against the grain and they get the sort of deep dark stuff out of people whether that's a good thing or a bad thing and actually when i sent my piece on james taylor over to a um, contact that i knew within the cricketing world a guy who'd been in the cricketing media business for genuinely about 25 years he, he came back and he was very much, oh, you, you could have asked about this, you could have asked about that. And I was thinking to myself, it was great advice. And some of the things I just thought, yeah, I could have made that piece much better. I mean, I always think that. We can always think that about whatever work we do. We can always make it better. But I was thinking to myself, like, that was him, the proper journo, you know, the proper guy who you know, wants to ask the tough questions. Mm -hmm. But if I'm honest, I'm not sure James Taylor would have answered them or been keen for the interview in the first place if I was kind of like that. Yeah. So you have to get a balance, particularly as a current player. You have to be a little bit careful, uh, and therefore you have to be you have to be clever in the topics that you do want to talk about, uh, and hopefully make it niche so that people do want to read it. I think um, yes, yeah, so we talk about uh, James Taylor. Um, 
yeah, what a, what a story to be at the top of his game and then have a setback and then get back as a as a selector. Um, made it fascinating reading. I really enjoyed it. I think as as professional sports people, we can learn a lot from other sports. How was it interviewing him and and really getting getting into him and and picking his brains? Mate, it was it, it's for me. I've always been writing about rugby. Uh, a lot of what I wrote about before the World Cup is kind of just my experiences, like as I mm. say, a blog. Um, so I have done some interviews. They're a completely different cup of tea uh, and a lot harder. Um, but I really wanted to challenge myself to do, you know, something from someone from another sport, purely actually it's for my benefit to hear his story, to hear his kind of exactly. way of thinking, but also to give people again, you know, well rugby player talking to a cricketer you know how can that you know correlate and 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 good stuff come from that um and yeah no it, it's great fun i'd love to you know speak to a footballer speak to a gymnast um there's some contacts that i that i had that i might try and do in the future i'm a bit busy moving house at the moment but at the same time you know all those things and, and the thing is about the interview kind of stuff is that it's a bit like playing rugby as in play, being a pro you do training in the week. So you're training in the week is doing your research, conducting the interview, making sure you've got good questions. And then the performance is obviously writing it, editing it, sending out to some people, asking you like, does that look good? Should that be like that? And then you send it out to the public and you're wanting, you know, it's like your performance on the pitch. You're wanting to do well, yes, for yourself, but also to, to, to play well in front of the fans or whatever. So there's that element which I quite like that correlates a little bit to, to the code. Um, always and, thinking uh, about the code, yeah, mate. Can't escape. Always it. <laughs> still thinking about the code, and uh, no, but it, you know it's important and it, it's good fun. So moving on to another article you, you've, you've written, um, Will one on the championship um, cuts um, that are going to take effect uh, for next season. Championship's been championship's been hit pretty hard with COVID stopping, um, and we'll have a we'll have a bit of uh, insight into the different setups within championships within teams and how that's going to affect. Um, how, in your opinion, you know, every club's going to deal with this differently. How do you think the championship as a whole league is going to, is going to bounce back from this? Ah, oh, man, it's one of those questions where I wish I could give a great answer and um, get paid millions for it, even though no one's got millions at the moment. But you know what I mean? Um, I just, look, I mean, actually talking about that article, is ironic. You know, I was talking uh, to Justin Blanchett, very good friend of mine, uh, ex Bedford Blues, um, ex ex the Chiefs back in the day, and Canadian international. Um, and all of it was about championship cuts, um, how vulnerable rugby is, and all things like that. Um, and he's made the decision to come out of it. He's now starting his kind of road towards um, he's getting involved in the kind of wealth management. Um, and it's it's it was amazing. Then what a month or two later, then a pandemic hits, and then we really are talk about being vulnerable rugby players are in a very vulnerable situation um i think the championship has its has had its problems the whole time and obviously i'm going to be very careful how i kind of voice it uh, ultimately i'm still a rugby player and you know i want to make sure that i get paid and uh, can still be <laughs> playing <a> player. <laughs> yeah exactly um <clears throat> but i think everyone has quite significant views um guys who've got way bigger views than me um but I think it's the championship has been a league that has always struggled financially. It's always been a little bit sort of um, the disparity in the league has been very obvious. A lot of questions about ring fencing, a lot of questions about, you know, player salaries being so low at the beginning anyway, you kind of question, well, why, why are players actually bothering to do this, putting their bodies on the line for 20K salaries? Um, and And then obviously the... The RFU makes the decision to, to cut the funding at that time, and we must talk as if we talk about that time. It didn't make a lot of sense to me because in my opinion, if anything like the funding needed to continue to happen, I believe it is definitely a conveyor belt of talent uh, that goes into the premiership, goes into them playing for England, goes into them playing for the other nations as well. And I personally believe you need two good quality professional leagues for rugby in England. Um, and you know, it for me, yeah, it's paramount. But there's other issues whereby I do think some clubs are maybe a bit more kind of sit back, put a game on at the weekend for the locals and have a good time. I'm not saying that's the wrong thing. 
And then you've got other clubs, the likes of, let's say, someone like Ealing, very ambitious, wanting to throw money at it. And fair play to them in many aspects. You know, they have got a genuine drive to try and be at the top of the table and try and even get promotion. And therefore, when you've got that disparity between different owners thinking different things, you know, like we've been playing at Bedford. Bedford never wanted to go into the Premiership. Therefore, it is quite hard, even as a player, to be involved in a setup whereby there is actually no goal to go and get into the Premier Premiership status. But at the same time, people are so worried about the financial implications. And this is where rugby, you know, it is not a good product, ultimately. You know, it's not a good um, thing that sells very well, I don't think. And I think it always, at the moment, is going to struggle to gain real sort of financial benefits. Um, the championship is one that illustrates that to a T. Um, and it's really frustrating because obviously we know guys, good close mates of, of ours, who are quality, quality rugby players and train really hard for little money. And the disparity of the money, obviously, then you've got the top part of the guys in the premiership earning way over 500k. And then you've got the guys in the championship who are earning maybe 20, 25. So I don't know if that's really answered the question, what you said there. But in terms of where, again, COVID then throws an absolute spanner in the works is the financial implications are now even worse. The RFU doesn't have funding now to really give anyone because it's going to lose so much money for itself. And therefore, when you say, well, what is going to happen to the championship? I don't know. I think there's numerous ways of going about it. I've spoken to people about what you could do, what may work. Do you maybe look at clubs who are professional and you have like a super six or, and then the other clubs who are maybe less have to go part time being like almost engulfed within the national one system as well. As I say, it is so hard to predict um, because we don't know when this is going to end and we don't know when therefore a championship season is going to start. Yeah, I mean, you talk about being being careful what you have to say and everything. I think I think you've done it in the totally correct way and, and asked questions rather than stated opinions. Obviously, we all have our opinions on uh, on where things are going within rugby with, within any any department. You can look at any area of rugby, uh, North Hem- Northern Hemisphere versus South. You, everyone's got got an opinion on that, but it's about asking those right questions. I think you're asking some really good questions of some people really high up in the RFU of, of the funding of basically why why it's been cut, um, this is what's happened there, um, where's the money going to go, uh, what about these other players that have put their lives into rugby for very, very small salaries, what's going to happen to them? I think you've asked some really good questions. And, and, and to be honest, Mark, the other thing as well is, is yeah, you're right, yeah, I think there, it's good to ask questions um, because you know as a rugby player that the game has come on so much you know, guys are stronger, fitter, quicker, more talented, more skillful, if that's probably the right way of saying it. Therefore, the game has actually gone up in terms of its toughness, in terms of its competitiveness, and it's way more cutthroat than I think it ha- has been. But yet the, the finances and the product, in my view, I think a lot of people agree, is going down. And then obviously we talk about wages and funding cuts and then, you know, should that really be on the, I mean, this is kind of a separate topic, this, but should that really be on the players to be kind of having to take cuts and whatever now when you think to yourself, hold on a minute, you know, I'm, I'm actually getting better, you know, or this is harder, you know, this is, you know, massive injuries are going on in this game as well. And yet you do just feel sometimes a little bit kind of the game, in my view, could be doing a lot more I don't know. I, don't, I can't give you the answers. Otherwise, I'll be, you know, it's way above my pay grade. But, like, they could be doing a lot more to make rugby more attractive, more accessible, and I think financially better. Throw COVID-19 into mix, and I now completely understand everything becomes now 10 times harder. And then it also becomes 10 times harder for players. Players are now waiting for contracts. Players are waiting for negotiations to go on. And I think you're going to see a lot of players getting sort of like a cull of professional rugby players, particularly in the championship, who just go, you know what, I have to look at my life going forward, you know, wanting to start a family, whatever it might be. And I'm not so sure that playing in the championship rugby or even rugby in general is going to give me that sort of, um, well, sort of. Uh, what's the word I'm kind of looking for? Um, just to give someone basically like a projection of how their money and life is going to move forward rather than it's going to stagnate at the moment and probably go back. 
Well, yeah, I think I think you're totally right with um, with the skill level. I think I think it's becoming harder to be a professional rugby player physically. Um, with you'll both be seeing the work that you're going to be having to do with your fitness, with your weights, and you have to be bigger to play rugby. You have to be fitter now. You have to be strong. You have to be more powerful to get to the elite level of the game. You have to be more skillful, and all that time the risk is going up at the same time that there's get, there's getting more injuries. Both you guys know. Um, that concussion rates are up. You've had pretty bad concussions, both of you. And it's within that low level of rugby, you're talking about some players on £20,000 a year. I think that is a really, really great question. Is it worth it? Yeah, but, and it's a sad but honest question. Um, mm. And we go back to the stuff about doing things outside of rugby, which is so important. You know, I probably have in my own heart, when I was, if you speak to me about seven eight years ago when I started kind of professional rugby, I'd be like, oh, I want to play until I'm like 36. Now, you know, like, geez, I'm, I'm delighted to be in the position I'm in at the moment. I feel very fortunate, very lucky. I'm with the US. I want to get another World Cup under my belt. But I've really got to be thinking about what else I'm going to do outside the game because I don't earn a load of money. You know, I can't just go and be like, yeah, that's sweet for me. That's going to last me then another 10 years. I can lie on that and maybe pick up something later on. You know, that is the 0.0001% of our sport that are able to do that. The rest of us are, unfortunately, going to, um, it's going to be a quite a hard pill to swallow when it finishes uh, because you're going to have to move into something different and, and you're not going to be in the economic position of just being able to buy a load of properties and sit on the, you know, rent of those sort of places. You know what I mean? So, oh, look, I don't know. We, we generally could talk forever about it because I do think it's an issue that, yeah. Unfortunately, because of the uncertainty of the pandemic, you've got so much uncertainty actually as to what's going to happen in rugby with player salaries, what the league structure is going to look like. And then we haven't even, the big one, which is when the sport's even going to be allowed to go ahead again. Yeah. I think you, um, yeah. you, you put, it, put it really well, Will. I think a lot of players will have read your articles, you know, with Justin and, um, you know, the recent ones about COVID and stuff and will resonate with you um, very well. I think... Um, just going back to the league, so we'll, we'll chat a little bit more, I suppose. But um, we, yeah, we could chat all day. I think obviously with what they've sort of want to direct it to is more so the the A League and, and the university systems. Now, um, I know a lot of people who have been through the university systems, and that's a league that's getting better and better. And um, I suppose we spoke about the US League, and it's kind of like you know the MRL is the only professional league over there. And although we have our tier two champ, it's and we talk about the drafts happening, it could potentially go you know bridge that gap between university and that prem i suppose it, that that's one option that could it could end up in five plus years i hope it doesn't because i think you know you look at pro d do pro dirt in in france and um, how well the crowds are received over there and what a well supported league that is over there and you know obviously i speak speak goes out saying that championship is is the ultimate stepping stone for anyone trying to get to that top league so yeah it's very interesting to see where it's going to how it's going to pan out well, mate, it's interesting you mentioned about about the um, the pro de deux. Yeah, you can get the French de right de. in there. Well done, <laughs> deux. Um, yeah, mate, but it's interesting. I have a good friend of mine who plays with Perpignan, and actually, I interviewed him to do one of the Guardian pieces. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, sure. And yeah. he and he he just said to me, he said, and bear in mind that he's played in the Championship, played at Premiership, and he just says the thing about the French over there is they have thrown money into it. And actually, they've got quite a lot out of it. And I mean that in terms of, like, uh, the clubs, the owners, fair play to them. But then also, they've been clever. So, Pro D2 is on uh, on Thursday and Friday nights. So, those are the matches. They put them yeah. on TV. And then top 14 is Saturday, Sunday. So, automatically, there's no crossover. People, yeah. they love their rugby, and they absolutely do in France. They can watch rugby four days on the, on the bounce. Yeah. Sam, you would absolutely love it, mate. Be absolutely love pride it. and joy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and no, but it, it's it is it, it's it's well thought out on that in that that level, you know. It, those are the kind of the questions that I am asking. Maybe the governing yeah. bodies in terms of like, how, are they making the most of what we've got? Um, and Definitely. going back a little bit in terms of like the university thing, which is which is I think really good because I was chatting to I won't name him, but a um, a player who plays in the championship. I literally saw him socially distanced um, the other week. And he said now, we were talking a little about degrees. He said, if I was asked to give advice to an 18-year-old coming out of um, school, he said, I would tell them, 
to go to university, get a degree, get into a good rugby university if so be it. And then from that, maybe see if you can get into a premiership. Now I know it's not easy. And beforehand I probably said, I hate to say it, you're gonna to struggle to get into pro to the pro game. But because it's so vulnerable at the moment, rugby, get your degree under your belt and then see if you can do it or not. It's getting the, it's getting the foot in the door, isn't it? I think with anything, you know, in a business sense as well, if you can get the foot in the door and then develop, we had a podcast with my mate that I played with Max Clementson. And one of the highlights was, was him saying, you know, second year, first game was for the third team. And the last game was for England students, you know, and I know that's, that's quite a unique story, but it's getting that foot in the door. And like we've, we've said on the previous podcast, that it's such a good um, shop window now. And like you said, you're getting a degree out of it as well. Um, and I know f- the financial mm. burden of it all is, is a huge, huge part. And I can completely understand that. But for, for aspiring rugby players, you know, it's, 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 it's turning out to look to be a really good option. Well, you, met, you mentioned that university route as well. A lot of the players now that are signing these academy contracts are still going to university. Um, I know the lads at Newcastle Falcons who have just come through their academy and just signed in, into, the, um, in this, into the senior academy. They are, they're going to Durham, they're going to Newcastle University, they're going to massive universities. And they're all managing between playing university games, between playing A-league games, potentially even breaking into the first team. I think clubs are starting to realise this is the way that players are going to have to go. And yeah, I think this more humanistic approach where clubs are treating players like, like uh, people rather than just as commodities, I think that's a really great way to go. Um, I, I think you're spot on and I think... I think it actually maybe rugby's really got to look at itself like that. You know, it could be that you're an 18, 19 year old and rugby clubs actually pay for your degree. Basically say, you know, go to university, but we also, degrees will enable you to make sure you can do good amount of training, also not suffer in your academic. And it almost would be like a default thing you do. You will go to university that is affiliated with a rugby club. You know, if so be it, you just talked about, you know, Newcastle Falcons, you've got Durham and Newcastle Uni up there and plenty of others, I'm sure. That might be something which I think they have to do because it probably brings down costs for rugby clubs. But then it also, for the actual individual, it's huge. You know, you've got to be in a position, in my view, particularly when you're mid, mid-20s, mid if rugby ended tomorrow, is there something that you could bury yourself, not bury yourself in, but really get yourself into that could enable you to get another job? Because that's the way we, that's the world we live in at the moment. I, I would love to say that rugby, 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 it's fantastic. And we just go out there and we get paid so well and it's going so much in the right di- direction. But the bottom line is, is that you've got to be more interested in stuff that's going outside the game, you know, with, with everything that's going on. Yeah, so will we ask our guests at the end of each interview um, three questions? Um, they're all the same ones each week. The first one is... Um, do you have a book or a series that you're currently watching that people at home uh, might want to watch, might want to be inspired by? Uh, you can't so, say Last Dance. Uh, you can't say Last Dance. That, no, you can't fair enough. That. Well done. I mean, I've, I have watched The Last Dance. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Um, for me at the moment, I amazingly, this sort of maybe shock of you, but I never watched Prison Break. So I had five series that... Um, me and my partner were, we're gonna get stuck into we're on series four now um but that's not really loving that's not really a new one <laughs> so um i'll tell you what i'll tell you i tell you something that is interesting to me it's not necessarily a um a netflix thing or anything like that but uh the uh the recent space launch i'm not in, involved into space or anything like that but spacex and actually yeah. launched the other day that's that's pretty cool Yesterday. when you yeah. do some reading around that yeah so um um and just yeah just general other stuff there's a bunch of sport documentaries that are good at the moment aren't they so yeah yeah second question is uh, what's the best piece of advice uh that you've received within your personal or professional advice uh, career what's the best bit of advice on oh um you always i always get a few bits uh there was a coach, John Fletcher, uh, used to be yeah. England, the 18 coach, very RFU, good coach. Very, very good coach. coach. Don't know why they got rid of him, but that's nothing to do with me. Um, and um, he always used to say, live in the now. Whenever you were on the training pitch, someone dropped a ball, he would always be like, next job, next job, live in the now, live in the now. And it actually, I kind of feel it materialises, not just in rugby, but in, 
in general life you know i'm a big overthinker i think about stuff before that has gone stuff that is going ahead and we're probably all like that at the moment living in our thoughts because of just generally isolation the pandemic but you can try and be a bit more and say present living in the now that's probably the, the best advice that i i try and uh, do yeah the final question is one that we've probably just gone over quite a bit in this in this chat is um what's next for will Hooley? what's next for me move his um, house um <laughs> <Big, that's laughs> I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna be moving house yeah no look i'm um i've actually got exciting exciting 20 uh sorry 12 months ahead um obviously moving clubs um hopefully we get out of a pandemic um i'm getting married next year um so all all yeah. things there's actually a lot of a lot of good stuff in the future but um you know who knows what's gonna happen you know with everything going on yeah good stuff um yeah i think that's a really good good place to conclude the interview there conclude the podcast really um thanks for coming on well we really really appreciate your time um congratulations on your signing for saracens um if people want to follow your saracens journey your uh professional journey or international journey where can they find you on social media or oh, joining with the thousands of followers that i have uh that's a joke um yeah no twitter i'm will underscore hooley and then instagram i'm will just w hooley uh, all one word um yeah so uh if you can if you can be bothered then i would love it so thank you if got... you can be bothered to follow you sam where are you i'm at sam leaming 10 across all platforms and i am mark moss 1996 so yeah will thank you very much and thank you for watching <laughs>